Talking About Trauma, Part 2. I'm your host, Dr. Christina Wilkerson. During our program, we'll discuss the impact of gun violence and the trauma that remains. Our guests will share their stories about how gun violence impacted their lives and how they are coping with the aftermath. Later, we'll give you safety planning and support ideas for you to use or share. Gun violence impacts us all in various ways, and it is devastating. You may not know, but 100 Americans are killed every day with guns. And although the U.S. is just 4% of the world's population, it has 9% of global firearm homicides. On average, eight children and teens under the age of 20 are killed by guns every day. These are sobering statistics. Joining me to share their stories are Z, Joy, and Nia. Welcome. Thank Hello. You. Joy, why don't we start with you? What can you share with us about your experience with gun violence? Um, <clears throat> uh, I've experienced gun violence in a many of ways. Um, people I went to high school, have been shot and killed. A person I used to date um, was shot and killed. Mm. Um, my family was murdered um, in a domestic violence t um, situation um, involving a gun. Um, but I think the situation that um, left me the most traumatic or that impacted me the most was um, just uh, maybe about six months ago, my childhood friend was shot and killed um, the day that my son started kindergarten. And um, that situation, even to this day, still leaves me um, like speechless. It, mm -hmm. it still hurts. It's still, there's still um, um, an anger. There's still uh, hurt that, 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 that bruise inside of me for my friend, for his family, his siblings, um, his parents. Um, it was a very close friend. We grew up in church together and um, he was just taken away just for no reason, mm. just shot and killed blocks from where he was staying with his grandmother. And to this day, uh, we don't know who did it, why they did it. There was, there's no reason um, even behind it. And it just hurts to know that somebody that I grew up with and then somebody that's so, that was still so young, we were only like a year, um, a year apart, year dif age difference from each other, to know that he couldn't even see past 25, 21, it, it, it breaks my heart. And there's no, there's, no reason or explanation behind it. Yeah. It's a tragic situation for any of us to witness. It sounds like you've had a lot of loss mm -hmm. due to gun violence. Yeah. I'm wondering, Nia, um, C, do you all have any stories of how gun violence has impacted you? Uh, I got like a countless amount of friends who just are no longer here due to gun violence. Mm -hmm. And it's um it's it's real sad just because, you know, where we we live at is depicted as like a war zone and mm -hmm. most uh most times you see it on T V or if it's just like just some extremely unsafe place to live. Uh which at times it can be but it's um it's just really, you know, sad to 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 know that people that you've known your whole life or that you are close with or uh, just that you see on a regular basis could just be gone at any time. And mm -hmm. it's, um, it's, it's also shocking to know just like how close it can happen mm -hmm. to you. So. Um, <clears throat> um, I have also had um, a couple of family members affected by gun violence. And um, one thing that I, I do realize is that uh, a lot of times people do just um, be like, oh yeah, that won't happen to me until it actually happens. And um, the it's it's a, a complicated feeling because um, a couple of my family members 
were involved with um, uh, areas to where it is more uh, popular to deal with gun violence. And um, it's it was seen as a, well, what did you expect type thing. Mm. And, but the fact that it was uh, normal is definitely what got me. Um, and um, I feel for you, Joy, especially to to not have any type of closure. Mm. That yeah. uh, That is one of the hardest things. Yeah, I too have lost family and friends to gun violence and I, it's, it's, been years since one of my family members has passed, but I can still, the, the anniversaries of the passing, the birthdays, hearing another family member's voice, because I got the call first, um, because that family member couldn't get in touch with my father. And so, I, remembering hearing that family member's voice and just, it, it's, it's haunting, it stays with you. Um, and it can be really challenging to understand and make sense of something, mm -hmm. especially when you don't have that closure mm -hmm. and when you experience it over and over again, because mm -hmm. both Joy and Yuzi are both talking about this is something I've experienced not just once, but several times mm -hmm. over, right? I um, think um, the, the night before he was killed, I just, I couldn't sleep. Like something in me, I just kept tossing and turning and um, before he died last year, I had just been experiencing a lot of deaths and it just seemed like it just, the pressure was not letting up. It's just mm -hmm. death after death after death. And I just told myself, like, I can't take it anymore. Like, w like what's next? And I just remember me sleeping, tossing and turning. I'm like, something's not right. And I just remember um, my godmother calling me and she was just like, you know, have you seen the news on face? Like, have you been on Facebook? And I'm mm. what? Like, what is going on? I'm I'm getting my son ready for school. Like, I haven't been on Facebook. This, you know, I was trying to cherish the day of my son starting school. His school, he started started kindergarten, and I just remember my godmom saying, like, you you haven't been on. Facebook. She was like, is it true? And I'm like, well, what are you talking about? And I just remember the exact time. It was 7:51 in the morning, and I she said, I'm gonna call you right back. And it was 7:51 when she called me back, and I said. I said no. I said I, I, I can't. I like I can't accept this. Why? Who would do something like this? Why, why was it necessary to take his life? You know. And I I asked that even about my cousins that were killed. Like they were. It was. Th they were three sisters. My three co little cousins, and they were shot and killed. I I asked myself why is there a need to take three innocent little mm -hmm. little girls' lives away? Like how do you? I asked myself how do you sleep at night knowing. That, that this is what you've done to their mother, their father, their family. Mm -hmm. You know, I ask myself that all the time for my friends that have lost their brothers or their cousins or just their best friends they went to high school with. I mean, I've lost numerous of friends that I went to high school with because in the area that my high school in, it's just like their violence is just it's so prevalent. You can't go get around it. Right. Uh you guys are bringing up something that's really interesting as we're talking about our experiences and our understanding. Um, you're mentioning areas, right? All, mm -hmm. all three of you are mentioning like there are certain areas where this is popular or that this happens often and it's normalized. Um, what are some of the challenges we experience when we're maybe living, working, going to school in these areas and gun violence is prominent? Um, I think it has a lot to do with depression and you looking at your area like mm -hmm. you know when I used to go drive, take the bus to school I when we would drive and we would go home and taking the people to their different routes I just be like this is just so depressing to look at there's no color in the neighborhood there's no there's barely any stores the, the houses don't they don't look happy like there's just this depressive look or depressive state that mm -hmm. these areas there's trash everywhere there's the, sh the roads aren't good you know is the you see a bunch of kids walking home it's just not a happy place whereas uh, uh, an area where it's a little more um the upkeeping in the area of the socioeconomic status is a little higher you'd be like oh well these kids don't have anything to worry about they live in these nice houses they their their parents have nice jobs they they drive nice cars why would why would violence live here they're not angry they're not stressed they're not mm. depressed looking at a beautiful house so i think it has a lot to do with i i have i see it as 
this depressive state when you look at the area that you come from. Mm. Uh, to kind of piggyback off of that, I think uh, when you look at like the area, it kind of um, adds like a level of fear. Because mm. mm. um, like speaking like personally for myself, uh, when I was in probably like junior high or maybe younger, probably it was like fourth or fifth grade, I had a friend who was like in my class and she's like, you know, she lives in my neighborhood. Uh, I see her all the time, like we talk all the time. And she um, she was murdered, uh, like mm -hmm. literally like not even a whole block away from my house, like like wow. probably like two or three houses down from my house. And like I could go on my front porch and I can see like the space where she was murdered at. Mm -hmm. And it's um, like when you think of it that way, it's like you have to have like a level of fear because it's like, am I even safe to walk home? Especially uh, as young as I experienced that, it's like, I'm not even sure I can like walk to school, or come home from school without you know anything happening. If I want to go to the store, I am I okay to do that? Mm. It's um you know it's a it's a level of fear there, and um it's always shocking when it happens so close because it's uh it's it's a level of shock and it it adds to the emotion. Yeah. So with cultural considerations like the neighborhood, the race, or even gender of an individual, it's important to note that firearms are one of the first leading causes of death for black children and teens. And 58% of American adults or someone they care for have experienced gun violence in their lifetime. Some specific populations have alarming numbers when we think about gun violence. And so as we were discussing, as there are certain stigmas around gun violence, maybe with gender or, or race, when we think about this issue? I think when, we, when there's a discussion about gun violence, it instantly goes to black males. Like, that's just the correlation that I think that the media has portrayed, and it's probably some statistics as well have shown, like, black males are at an alarming rate for gun violence or to be victims of gun violence. But I also think we need to consider um, what's not being portrayed, what's not being put out there as far as um, Caucasians and their use of guns and what they do with guns, the increase on school shootings um, and mm -hmm. who the suspects are in those cases. Because in, if not most cases, they're not black males mm -hmm. uh, looking at perpetrators of police violence, gun, uh, police brutality, who the victim is and then who the perpetrator or the suspect is. And most of the time it's a, ma a black male victim or a black victim and a white perpetrator. So I think it's important to look, not look at it so one-sided. That's a great point. Mm -hmm. We don't always think about it from that perspective mm -hmm. of like gun violence is a global issue, mm -hmm. not just a race issue. Yeah, to piggyback off what she said, I feel like when you look at the news and you see gun violence, like you see someone who probably looks like me, mm -hmm. and it's um, is 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 it kind of sucks to to be in that position because you know, uh, if you look at me, I'm a large black guy. I usually got on a hoodie, so like I'm looked at as a threat, and uh, like it'll probably be hard to believe, but I've never even like held a gun. Mm. But, you know, in the eyes of society, like, I probably have a couple of guns, like, in my car right now, Charges you know, mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, it's like a, a big stigma around it because, you know, you look at the news and if you see, like, a black guy kill somebody, you see his face, like, plastered all over everywhere just so you know who did it. But if it's, like, you know, a church shooting, you know, we're not going to necessarily show you, like, who did it or uh, we're not going to use excessive force to take this person down. But it's like, you know, let it be someone who looks like me, then we're going to show you how much of a threat this person is or how much of a threat that we think that you should think he is. And, it, uh, like I said, it, it, it does suck to be in that position. Um, <clears throat> I remember doing research on uh, mass shootings and um and how it's portrayed in the media and i remember um mike brown had uh, recently passed and the uh, uh las vegas shooting had recently happened mm -hmm. and i was looking at the different ways of how uh, those uh, two situations were being portrayed and literally the the um the headline for 
the Las Vegas shooting was. Um, he was uh, humble and home quiet before the shooting. Mm -hmm. And then um, for um, Mike Brown, he it was like, yeah, he was a rapper. Troubled and teen. Yeah, a troubled teen when, but it's like, Mike Brown's on the opposite side. And this man just like intentionally set up a hotel room mm -hmm. to shoot down all these people. Mm -hmm. Why is it that Oh no, we already know why. But <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about the why. Okay. Why is it, right? Like why cuz where you guys are making some really great points. There's mm -hmm. there's racial disparity happening mm -hmm. in the conversation. A lot of times when there's when it's a um a black suspect or if the suspect has not um been caught or apprehended yet, a lot of times the media will say or reports will say like a suspect, a threat to society or a suspect mm -hmm. at large, like where if it was a white male, it's like, oh, the suspect has still not been found, the search continues, da, 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 da. but when it's like a black male, they're like, we need to hurry up and find this person, it's a threat to the community, you know, his family is at jeopardy, and it's just like, when does, when, when will people realize that gun violence doesn't have a color, it doesn't have a race, it mm. doesn't have a, a name to it, it doesn't have a picture. Bullets don't have names, bullets mm. don't have eyes, they land wherever the weapon is shot at, shot to, shot from. There's no, I'm gonna shoot this person because they're black, I'm gonna shoot this person because they're in the gang. Granted, it does, you look at the individual, mm -hmm. and that's who you need to, that's where it needs to be looked at, is the individual, who's shooting, what's going on with the person that is shooting, is it gangs, is it depression, is it mental health, like what is going on? Mm -hmm. I think for me, I, that's something I always key in on as a mental health professional. When the narrative and the disparity of a white shooter is framed around the narrative of this is someone who, is, who has mental health issues, mm -hmm. this is someone oh, who yeah. is troubled. I mean, that runs through my body because mm -hmm. it's, it, I don't see that same narrative being considered mm -hmm. for other minority groups. Mm -hmm. right. um, and the idea that Again, the issue, I love how you said that, Joy, the issue is not about mental health because then there's this also this weird stigma that comes around. These people have to be crazy people. There right. has to be something right. mentally unstable mm -hmm. with them to, to do this. And so then it creates even more stigma around mental health as well. Mm -hmm. And that people who may have depression or bipolar are more likely to shoot someone. And that's just not the case, mm -hmm. right? It, it's, it's not about, gun violence is not about race. It's not about necessarily just mental health. It's, it's a violent issue um, that, again, we haven't really taken the time to unpack like we're doing now. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, when we think about this even, the U.S. each year, about 36,000 Americans lose their lives to gun violence. Yes. 100,000 are wounded and about 10,000, or at least 10%, with life-altering consequences. That's a lot of people, right? And so race can be a factor, as we talked about, but there is that disparity, right? I mean, you, you guys were mentioning it even with like police shootings. Um, however, what we're finding is this is not based on race. This is more so based on um, really police and other individuals that enter these communities not having an understanding of that community, mm -hmm. um, segregation and racial bias mm -hmm. like we're talking about. And this is perpetuating this cycle of gun violence and police brutality. And so here's, the, here's a good question. What needs to change? How do we change gun violence? Certain people do feel like they need to carry a gun or they feel like they should carry a gun. Uh, some people feel like we don't. But, I mean, across the board, like, it has to be, like, you know, equal rights for people to carry a gun. Mm -hmm. And I think before we see, like, the equal rights for who can carry a gun, I think we have to look at gun violence and make that equal for everyone across the board. Because, like, we were just saying, mm. um, when you look at gun violence, the poster child for it is black men. Mm -hmm. And whenever, you know, a black guy kills somebody or a black guy is the victim, they do as much as they can to discredit this person and say, oh, he was an aspiring gangster rapper or he was, you know, unemployed person and didn't have a job this or uh, had X amount of kids, just anything they can, mm -hmm. detail they can find to just like discredit this person. Mm -hmm. But whenever it's, you know, the shoes on the other foot and it's like a white man or a white victim, um, 
he, it's, he had uh, mental health issues, you know, mm -hmm. and it's like they they even <clears throat> use that as a blanket to like to cover up. And it's like you say, like you you had so much planning and preparation. There's no way you can just blame that on just you know you had mental health issues. Mm -hmm. Like if you just took a gun and just you know accidentally fired off, maybe we can say okay that might have been a, a mental issue or something. But for mm -hmm. you to go into so much planning and preparation. Uh, for weeks or however amount of time it is, like that's not something you can just cover up by saying this person had mental health issues. So right, right. You we, really invested money. We really gotta um, look at like you know, like how we're categorizing these people and saying like who can have guns and mm -hmm. who shouldn't have them, or you know what situation should you be okay to carry a gun in and all that kind of stuff. And I think we have to, in order to do that, we gotta really look at it like what it is. Mm -hmm. Um, I think also we need to look at history. We need to look at how how white supremacy has defined mm -hmm. gun violence, how they've written gun violence in history, how they've gone about the consequences and the the punishment for those of the that have done crime of uh, using guns. Mm -hmm. We, as of recent, we look at cases like. Um, <clears throat> a black woman who is defending herself against, you know, someone that's of a harm to her, yet she's in jail for X amount of years mm -hmm. or X amount of months, yet her counterpart could have done the same thing or did the same thing and they get pr pr probation or parole or whatever the case may be. Some uh, consequence that does not match the same crime. Mm -hmm. When we look at black males, we get black males who get the death sentence or get life for you know a crime of the same nature as their white counterpart who only gets two years or they get two years and then they get out for good behavior but we don't even or you know people in the the judicial um, pro, or the judicial branch they don't even look twice at the black male and say okay they've been in jail for five years let's see if they had good behavior and then maybe they can get out maybe they they um, are changed or when they get out you know we can give them the resources to get their life back on track you know we just need to look at how history has done people a minority not even just black but Hispanics or those of minority uh, culture you know how they um, are how they have to live their life, you mm -hmm. know, because of things that have happened to them in, involving a gun, you know, and we don't even look twice when it comes to a white person, you know. You don't say, oh, you know, they get out of jail, they can, because they're white, they can go back their normal lives, they can get a job, they can do this and that, but because somebody of a minority fashion, they can't even get a job. They can't even, they can't even vote. They can't even do simple things of that nature. So I think changing the narrative, changing um, history, looking at history, and then going forward and saying, okay, hey, let's look at how this white person and this black person, they did the same crime, the, the consequence or the time served should be the same. Or a lot of times, I don't even think, Yes, jail, because a, if a person has done wrong, they need to serve their time or there should be a consequence for doing wrong. But a lot of times, okay, it don't have to be jail. Let's think of some solutions. Let's think of some work that we could do to prevent this. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I think um, you pointing out that this there's a whole systematic mm -hmm. um, depression, not depression, um, disability when it comes to gun violence. Um, uh, being held accountable is really important and what could be a, a solution but it's like as as a people um, we don't pay attention to who's actually um, being these judges and these um, lawmakers. yeah these lawmakers <coughs> and I mean not to not to discredit the presidential election, but we we got to pay attention to who's in office too, mm -hmm. because that makes a huge difference on, like I was mentioning earlier, making a change in these gun laws mm -hmm. and then um, applying um, the 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 proper um, what's the word I'm thinking of punishment, mm -hmm. applying a, a proper punishment uh, according to the crime because there are too many cases to where um, people of different color have um, been charged dramatically 
different um, punishments mm -hmm. for doing the same thing. So there's, there's a lot systematically that we're talking about here as far as there needs to be equal rights as well as an equal um, punishment or, or ramification when it comes to gun violence. But there's something that you all have spoken to, too, about cycle-wise, what's happening within your communities, what's happening with your families. I think about in my own experience where I've got friends or family members who, I mean, we can't go into grandma's neighborhood, mm -hmm. right? Grandma lives here, but grandma doesn't know her great-grandchildren because it's not safe to go to grandma's neighborhood. Grandma's neighborhood isn't what it used to be. And so there's this, this cycle that's happening in our families, in our communities. And so I'm wondering, what do you, you know, think needs to change in those cycles within our communities? Maybe not on the systematic level, but maybe within our families and within our neighborhoods. Um, there was a time where uh, my son shared with me that he had a dream that um, a police officer shot him in the head and I instantly went in mommy mode I'm like oh my god no like you can't mm -hmm. I don't want you hearing about that like you're you're too young like you know just instant like protection mm -hmm. but I had to take mommy protection off and put mommy reality and was just explaining to him like yes maybe there are times where there are police officers that do harm people that look like you, little black and brown boys, but it was also like, you don't have to be scared. Like, it doesn't happen to, it happens, but it doesn't have to happen to you. Like, just mm -hmm. informing him, like, there are good police officers, not always making a deception, uh, deceptive picture of like all police officers are bad or all white people are bad or all you know everyone's out to get you but yes there are bad people here in this world but there are also a lot of good people so just reframing that uh, uh, that my, that thought of you know there it doesn't have to just be bad or right. you know that angry um, thought I acknowledge what he was saying but I also wanted to make it a lesson about, you know, it doesn't have to just be um, negative. Mm. So just changing that thought pattern or just um, giving it, even though it's negative, but also turning it to a positive and how it can be a lesson too. Okay. I think um, we got to kind of go back to policing ourselves and, you know, because mm. uh, like you say, uh, we, with the analogy with grandma's neighborhood and what it used to be like I can remember a time like where you know certain people in the neighborhood wouldn't just let everything slide wouldn't mm -hmm. let stuff go and you know certain certain people in the neighborhood you would look up look to to like stand up and say something mm -hmm. about certain it's things exciting. and it's like nowadays it's like you know people were just like running wild I don't want to sound like that old dude when you say the kids these days but it's like it's it's nobody holding us a, a, accountable yeah. for us mm -hmm. so I, th I feel like we have to get back to you know looking That's to good. the person next to you and, and letting them know that you know something they're doing is not necessarily acceptable and they should you know straighten up and uh, we all have to be you know those older people in our neighborhoods to just uh, just you know tell people they got to straighten themselves out and, mm -hmm. and get that together like once we be able to get back to that because like you say, like even your son, who's at a, a very young age, or you know, already developing fear of the police. Mm -hmm. Like we don't always feel like we can go to the police to mm -hmm. solve help. our problems and right. help us with stuff. So if we can't go to them, then who can we go to? Like so, you know, we have to, you know, get to a point where we can start to solve our own problems as well too. But as a whole, you know, we all have to just be holding each other accountable for stuff too. And then to my counterpart, to my to those who don't look like me, understand the mentality that we have. People that look like me, understand that we are the way we are because of what we've been through, because of how we've been oppressed, because how laws were made against us and people were against us. Understand that, because this, because this, is, this is why a lot of gun violence is happening in our community understand that laws need to be changed and enforced to see change because we're not going to see it if we just keep having these discussions you know mm -hmm. it, it goes above that higher than that so that's what i i want people to know put the guns down and then change change the narrative change the the laws and the policies and and the system change the system because the system is, is rigged, it's crooked, it's, mm -hmm. it's corrupt. So that's what I want. 
people to know. Period. <laughs> um, I think we. I want people to know that we got to get back to, you know, like you've been saying, like being a community. Mm -hmm. uh, let's let's not be afraid to to speak out. If you see something, say something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, like I said, we got to get back to policing ourselves. And uh, when I was coming up, I I didn't have a father figure, but on my block it was a couple of fathers, so I knew like that if my mom's not home, mm -hmm. that don't mean I can start acting crazy because Mr. Scott's right next door. <laughs> Come on, Mr. Yeah. Scott. <laughs> Mr. Cole is right on the other side. And mm -hmm. if Mr. Scott don't see it, Mr. Cole definitely right, got it. Right. Somebody gonna tell my mama. Mm -hmm. so, um, but yeah, we, we definitely gotta get back to policing ourselves. If you see something, say something. Um, for Like you say, for the other side of the people who are looking at us, um, especially police officers, if you can't look at me just being me, Mm. and not see a threat um you might not be cut out to right. to have that position or be carrying a weapon um and overall like i just we got to put the guns down and we got to stop shooting people yeah well i appreciate what you all have shared i think it's it's amazing to hear you all talk about what safety looks like what policy and reform and equal equality looks like when it comes to this issue Gun violence is a life-altering issue, as we've all discussed, and we could continue to talk about it all day. You know, however, our program is coming to an end, and I would like to thank our guests, Joy, Nia, and Z, for sharing their stories. Um, please review this program as often as you like, because healing is a continuous process. If you're experiencing trauma or know someone who is, we'll leave you with a list of supportive services if you're a GSU student, please reach out to the Counseling and Wellness Center for assistance. Also, visit our website to learn about related topics and resources, respondtoviolence.org. Again, that's respondtoviolence.org. Thank you for joining us.